1918. Nearly four years of bitter fighting climax in a thunderous German attack. Defeat stares the British and French in the face. Then halfway through this year, the Allies strike back. The stalemate of the trenches is suddenly over. The guns fall silent. We all stopped, looked at one another because we suddenly realized that we had no objective, nothing whatever to look forward to do. Yet for the Allies, 1918 is the costliest year of the war. After the slaughter, it brings hope that millions did not die in vain. We went mad, went mad. The gates were open and everybody went ashore. We were dancing in the streets with the wounded soldiers and the girls. This is the story of the year that changed everything, seen now for the first time in colour. January 1918, nearly three and a half years of war. On the Western Front, the British had suffered two million casualties, dead, wounded, and taken prisoner. The French, three million. The French army was only just recovering from the mutinies of spring 1917. The British army was desperately tired. And all of the fighting had been over just a few miles of French and Belgian mud. The British Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, believing that his generals had wasted lives at Passchendaele in late 1917, refused to send further reinforcements. At the front and at home, New Year's Day 1918 was bleak. When is this awful nightmare going to end? The country is getting tired out. People no longer talk of war. They are saturated with it. When are we again to lead our proper lives? Shall we ever do so again? But for Germany, New Year brought the chance to win the war. The German army were at last in a position to launch one final major offensive. The Russians had sued for peace and were no longer in the war, which enabled the Germans to release thousands of men to come back across to the Western Front, ready for their big offensive. The German commander on the Western Front, General Erich von Ludendorff, prepared for battle. The attack in the West would be one of the most difficult operations in history, I was perfectly sure. And I did not hide the fact. The German nation too would have to give all it had. On March the 21st, 1918, the German army attacked along a 64-mile front. It became known as the Ludendorff Offensive and was the greatest attack yet seen in modern industrialized warfare. Six and a half thousand guns and three and a half thousand trench mortars fired almost simultaneously along the front. Winston Churchill, by now back in government as Minister for Munitions, was visiting army headquarters in France. Exactly as a pianist runs his hands across the keyboard from treble to bass, there rose in less than a minute the most tremendous cannonade I have ever heard. After the artillery bombardment, German stormtroopers leapt into action. The great moment had come. The turmoil of our feelings was called forth by rage, alcohol and the thirst for blood as we stepped out heavily yet irresistibly for the enemy's lines. A 
heavy long-range machine gun fire was opened on us. The leading skirmishers pressing forward like hounds on a hot scent were very bold. March the 21st was turning into one of the most dramatic days of the war. German soldiers were stunned by what seemed a huge success. What we had not dared to hope came true. The enemy artillery was silenced with one gigantic blow. We got out on top and looked with wonder at the wall of fire towering above the English lines and the swaying, blood-red clouds that hung above it. We were bombarded with everything the Germans had got. At daybreak, we could see the Germans advancing down the valley. We sent back runners to battalion headquarters for instructions. The first two runners were either killed or taken prisoner. The third runner came back to tell us that the Germans were cooking breakfast in our battalion headquarters kitchen. In a fortnight, the German army advanced 20 miles over a 50-mile front, a massive capture of territory compared with the stalemate of the previous three years. The battle was over by the 4th of April. It was a brilliant feat and will ever be so regarded in history. What the English and French had not succeeded in doing, we had accomplished, and that in the fourth year of war. We are passing through the most critical time we have yet experienced. This Han is a wonderful fighter and has a wonderful organization behind him. But in fact, the Germans had failed to inflict a decisive defeat, and the British commander, Sir Douglas Haig, issued a rallying cry to his soldiers. Many amongst us are now tired. To those, I would say that victory belongs to the side that holds out the longest. There is no course open to us but to fight it out. Every position must be held to the last man. There must be no deterrent. With our backs to the wall and believing in the justice of our cause, we must fight on to the end. We have seen real war in earnest now. It has been a terrible time, but we remain unbeaten, though exhausted and the men are extraordinarily cheerful. It is heartbreaking to think of the fine fellows who have gone under. We never knew from one minute to the next when the Dark Angel would come along with a ticket for us. I mean, the shell bursts above you, shrapnel all the way around. A wound from shrapnel was far worse than a bullet wound. A shrapnel, if it hit you properly, would tear you to pieces. For the Allies, it was the most critical moment of the entire war. The Germans appeared to be on the point of breaking through and separating the French from the British armies. And this is one of the reasons why General Foch, the French commander, was appointed to be commander-in-chief of the Allies because with one single commander-in-chief he could order the British and the French to cooperate and the Germans would not be able to divide and conquer by pushing the armies apart. Ludendorff set his sights on Paris, now just 90 miles to the south. If the Germans captured it, victory would be theirs. On May the 26th, the German army renewed its offensive. Fritz put down a barrage like nothing I'd heard before. His name for this type of artillery fire was Trommelfuhrer, which means drum fire. And actually, this was the best description. It was like a roll on a tremendous kettle drum. In four days, the Germans advanced 30 miles and reached the River Marne. The French capital was in their sights. But now the fortunes would rapidly change. The first two months of the Ludendorff Offensive had brought over 350,000 Allied casualties, killed, wounded and taken prisoner. But the Germans themselves 
had suffered almost as many. Their lines were becoming stretched, but their commanders wanted one last push. By July 1918, German High Command still had some degree of optimism, but they were uneasily aware that time had almost run out. They had attacked four times and failed to comprehensively defeat the British and the French. The Americans had arrived on the scene, and so they decided to go for one last offensive along the River Marne. On July the 15th, 52 German divisions attacked. The French defences were set well back. When German stormtroops arrived, they were out of range of their artillery support. Allied tanks and infantry counter-attacked. The Germans really had finally run out of steam. Their huge offensives had made a desperate attempt to finally bring the war to an early close. And in some ways they'd come quite near to doing that, but then gradually by continually bashing away at different parts of the line, actually in the end they'd pretty much drawn their army to a standstill and there was nothing more to give. Ludendorff knew his gamble had failed. Everything I had feared and of which I had so often given warning, had here, in one place, become a reality. Our war machine was no longer efficient. Even though the great majority of divisions still fought heroically. By now, a million fresh American soldiers had arrived on the battlefield. The Allies could think of striking back. It was not just on the Western Front that the war was being turned on its head. In October 1917, an attack by the Germans and Austrians in northern Italy had driven the Italian army into headlong retreat. Finally, the Italians just managed to hold a line 15 miles north of Venice, while British and French troops were rushed in to help them. But in June 1918, after six months to regroup, the Italians were ready to counterattack. Their British allies were amazed by the turnaround in Italian morale. The news is splendid. The Italians have completely re-established their line. So everyone is talking of the beginning of the end. The Austrians are in a rotten state. And there'll be trouble when the news of their defeat becomes known. Then we all knew that Italy had been saved and we rejoiced together. But we did not know that Austria-Hungary had no less surely been doomed and must now disappear from the category of great powers. But it was back on the Western Front that the war had to be finally won. And now the full panoply of Allied tactics, armor and manpower would combine to produce the greatest display of military force the world had ever seen. On the 4th of July, 1918, an Australian division led a small-scale but pulverizing attack. It was an absolute model of how battle should be fought. Infantry advancing behind tanks, being supported by masses of heavy guns, machine gun barrages from the machine gun corps, and with the Royal Air Force in close support, and actually dropping ammunition by parachute as well for the first time. The whole thing was a great success because of secrecy. The Germans had absolutely no idea that this was about to happen, and surprise w was absolutely complete. Learning from the Australian success, British and French commanders now planned a similar attack, but on the grand scale. Spearheaded by 530 British and 70 French tanks, the Allies concentrated a huge force near the town of Amiens. On August 8th, at 4 a.m., hidden in a mist which continued to shroud the preparations of the preceding night, our artillery opened an intense fire which demolished the enemy's batteries. The enemy, wholly surprised by the violence and rapidity of the attack, fell back in great confusion. 
when suddenly, with a mighty roar, more than a thousand guns begin a symphony. Instantly, the whole complex organisation begins to move forward. Every man, every unit, every vehicle and every tank sweeping on relentlessly and irresistibly. We have advanced 10 kilometres. It's the beginning of a war of mobility. For the Allies, it was the greatest day of the war so far. The attack was so quick and unexpected that one German brigade staff was captured while having breakfast. Organization was perfect. As for advancing, the speed was terrific. It was glorious once again to be in the rush for an advance, so different from March, when we were the ones on the backward track. The Allies advanced about eight miles, and the Germans suffered casualties of the order of 27,000. Now this was a sort of victory which had not been seen on the Western Front since 1914. Over the next month, the Allies pushed the Germans back 25 miles over a 40-mile front. Allied commanders were seeing an astounding change. The discipline of the German army is quickly going, and the German officer is no longer what he was. It seems to me to be the beginning of the end. I think the Bosch must retire along this whole front before the winter. You have every reason to be cheerful at home. But of course you mustn't suppose that it's anything in the nature of a walkover yet. He has still got plenty of kick in him. If we are allowed to live together again after the war, we will do something with our lives to show our gratitude for God's goodness. But of course, I'm not home yet. The biggest transformation of all was the arrival en masse of the Americans under their commander, General John J. Pershing. The sheer force of extra manpower would mean that however long it took, the Allies were bound to win in the end. By July 1918, a year after they'd first begun to arrive, there were a million Americans on the Western Front. Allied confidence was swelled by their new allies. There are plenty of Americans along the line. There's grown a wonderful mutual understanding between our boys and the Yanks. I'm sure the Yanks are going to prove excellent fighting troops. I loved it. Gained weight, and I fairly bounced out of bed in the morning, oozing with pep. In mid-September 1918, the Americans launched their first attack as an independent army. Their target, the wedge of German-held territory, at San Miel. It was a triumph. Pershing was jubilant. San Miel probably did more than any single operation of the war to encourage the tired allies. A few days after San Miel, an American force joined the British and French for a major attack on the German army's key defensive rear position, the Hindenburg Line. The Hindenburg Line was a, an extremely tough defensive position, consisting of belts of barbed wire, of concrete pillboxes, and the Germans, if they were going to stop the Allies anywhere, it was going to be here. For the ordinary Allied soldier, taking on the Hindenburg Line seemed an impossible task. We had attacked it the year before without any success. Now we were going to try again, but no one seemed to think we should do any better this time. Even the Australians said that we should find we were banging our heads against a stone wall. In the last week of September, 123 Allied divisions about half a million men gathered. General Foch issued his final order for the offensive which could decide the war. The nature and importance of this operation requires that all its early gains be followed up without the slightest delay. 
the rupture of the line of resistance must be exploited with no interruption to as great a depth as possible. For this reason, halts in the progress of the action must be avoided. The trench stalemate was becoming a thing of the past. With ever more accurate artillery barrages softening up the enemy, Allied soldiers were now realizing Foch's ambition for a war of movement. We immediately got word to go forward. So with the encumbrance of a Lewis gun, we started. We were very excited and there was a lot of noise. Kept expecting to get knocked out by a shell, but wasn't. We went across ditches and through wire, getting more soaked and torn. We search forward. Scarcely have men gone a hundred meters when machine gun fire sweeps the plane. Bullets whistle everywhere. We manage to advance nevertheless. We were in a pretty fine mess. Filthy dirty, all mud, soaking wet up to the thighs and clothes all torn. Brooks was killed in advance and I heard that Holt was wounded by a shell. One British wireless operator followed the infantry over the top to set up a front-line station to report progress. But his unit had lost a vital piece of equipment. We found we had no aerial. And I went back and found it, and then went back through the trenches, to the support trenches, to, to take it back. And on the way there, I had to walk over dead men. The only, the only people I had communication with was dead men, you might say, because I had to walk on them and say, sorry, chum. In three days, the Allies suffered thousands of casualties. But on the 29th of September, they broke through the once impregnable Hindenburg Line. The news from all fronts was simply stupendous. And tomorrow we should join in. It was going to be the biggest battle of the war and the greatest victory. The Bosch simply hadn't a chance. We shall go through them, the Colonel said, like a knife through butter. We shall be eating our Christmas dinner in Berlin. They convinced me. I'd seen with my own eyes that our task looked impossible. But their enthusiasm was so great that I was persuaded. The impetus was now general. All the Allied armies were attacking in turn. The enemy was not given a moment's respite. He was to be continually harassed until victory was within our grasp. The breaking of the Hindenburg Line was a huge psychological blow to the German army. Ludendorff, its most aggressive commander, decided that while his soldiers still retained some fighting ability, an armistice should be sought with the Allies. But for Ludendorff, it had to be an armistice which preserved German pride and territory. Back in January, President Wilson of America had proposed a 14-point plan for a peace that would be honorable to all sides. Allied leaders and commanders now gathered to discuss peace terms that could be offered to Germany. At the same time, Germany appealed directly to America. The Germans decided the only game left in town was to attempt to separate the United States from Britain and France and try to negotiate with the Americans on the basis of accepting the 14 points. Now this was a completely transparent move to try and, if you like, get a get-out-of-jail-free card. And nobody, including the Americans, were prepared to accept it. The British and French demanded, as part of any peace settlement, the abolition of the German monarchy. To traditionalists like Ludendorff, this was an affront. With the German army apparently still willing to fight on, Ludendorff had now recovered his nerve and hopes of peace were shattered. 
Though it was nearing its death throes, the war was not finished yet. By mid-October 1918, a sense of doom had spread to the German home front. The Allied naval blockade had cut off most of Germany's food supply. Its ships were stuck in port. People were starving. In the field, rations were diminishing by the day. Despite General Ludendorff's determination to fight on, other German commanders knew the game was up. The morale of the troops has suffered seriously, and their power of resisting diminishes daily. They surrender in hordes whenever the enemy attacks. I do not believe there is any possibility of holding out over December. Ludendorff does not realize the whole seriousness of the situation. Whatever happens, we must obtain peace before the enemy breaks through into Germany. If he does, woe on us. As Germany fought pointlessly on, for the Allies' exhausted soldiers, it seemed a more wasteful war than ever. How I wish the Hun would chuck it before we lose thousands more valuable lives. I can imagine the man in the trench being very disinclined to pop the parapet, with peace so close at hand. Oh, I am weary of this war. The casualties reported today are 253 officers and 6,000 men. Our casualties for many weeks past have been enormous. They must have averaged 30 to 40,000 per week. The hospitals are full to overflowing. One volunteer orderly told me that some of the cases sent over were so bad that they were actually packed up in boxes. I think it is safe to say that it cannot be much longer. The Huns we met were certainly nothing to fear and could think of nothing but peace. French and Belgian refugees returned to villages and towns which had been occupied by the German army and ruined by war. By early November, most German soldiers could clearly see the ruin within their own ranks. The German armies were in very bad shape. Every soldier and civilian was hungry. Losses in material could not be replaced, and the soldiers arriving at the front were too young, poorly trained and often unwilling to risk their necks because of war looked like a lost cause. Ludendorff still wanted to fight, and called on German troops to reject all proposals for peace. But then came sudden collapse. On October the 26th, the Kaiser sacked Ludendorff for insubordination. Two weeks later, the Kaiser himself abdicated and went into exile. The German politicians left behind knew they had to submit to Allied terms. Five o'clock on the morning of November the 11th, an armistice was signed on a train in the French forest of Compiègne. At 11 o'clock, on the 11th day of the 11th month, the guns of the Western Front fell silent. Everything stopped and there was what I can only call as a deadly hush over everything. And we all stopped looked at one another because we suddenly realised that we had no objective, nothing whatever to look forward to do. Nothing to do. It was a very eerie feeling. You have won the greatest battle in history and rescue the most sacred of all causes, the liberty of the world. You have full right to be proud, for you have crowned your standards with immortal glory and won the gratitude of posterity. We went mad. 
went mad. The gates were so mad when he went ashore. We were dancing in the streets with the wounded soldiers and the girls. All went mad. <laughs> I suppose it was the most remarkable day in the history of the world. The streets soon became so crowded that it was impossible to move. The crowds were cheering. Young girls were being carried on the shoulders of soldiers. Soldiers were being carried in the arms of civilians. The thought of going home made us noisy and hilarious. We'll soon turn in our mules and go home where we can eat sugar, sleep in bed, see our folks, and uh, chase around the girls. Girlfriends, sons, daughters, and above all mothers embraced the returning heroes. She was only too glad to get me back because I was her sunny boy. <laughs> she made so much fuss of me. She was glad to have me back. I think that was the utmost thought of her mind. I'm glad he's home safe. While we were going through the formalities of disembarking, a strange and unreal thought was running through my mind. I had a future. There was a future ahead of me, something I had not imagined for some years. As the man came back and explained what they'd been through. People couldn't grasp it. People couldn't grasp that you uh, went through that. I came out of the army, and the more I thought about it, the more I came. Why should two civilizations? Go out and shoot one another. It's nothing but murder. If there was any God at all, why didn't he cut the Kaiser down? And why didn't they cut Hitler down? Not sacrifice all those lives. For the British, the most costly year of the First World War was not 1916, the year of the Somme, not 1917, the year of Passchendaele, but 1918, the year of victory. Victory, of course, after huge uh, attacks by the Germans in the early part of the year. But that's a very important fact. In 1918, the year when the First World War was won, we lost more men than the whole of the Second World War. But for the moment, there was only relief as French towns welcomed their liberators. Belgium, which had been the target of Germany's first great act of aggression in 1914, rejoiced in freedom. Its king returned to a tumultuous reception in Brussels. the German army began the slow journey home. The march home ordinarily would have been a depressing affair, but the tremendous joy and relief that the war finally had come to an end dominated our emotions completely. Whatever awaited us from now on in civilian life would be easy by comparison. I was not at all afraid of the future. Under the terms of the armistice, German troops who still remained with the colours were able to march back into Germany. And I've often thought this was a major mistake, a psychological mistake, made by the Allies, because that allowed the German people to fool themselves that somehow they hadn't really been beaten. Their troops were marching back rather than being taken back as prisoners. Twelve days after the signing of the armistice, the German Navy officially surrendered and handed over its ships to the British. English officers and men climbed down to our deck. Our hearts nearly ceased to beat, and we bit our lips in defiance of our shame. No, not shame, for we sought with pride of all our victories and heroic deeds. When the English flag was hoisted, 
We turned our back on it and looked towards our own land. Germany's high seas fleet sailed to the British base at Scarpa Flow to put itself under Allied control. Nine months later, in a final act of defiance, German sailors would sink their own ships. One tiny light in the gloom for Germany's defeated commander. The history of the German people is concluded for the moment by the peace. The future lies dark before us. The only bright spark being the actions of the men at Scapa Flow. All delusions have vanished. We look into nothingness. We saw the ships at Scapa Flow. Some were still showing their funnel and part of the, the upper deck. You know, they're starting on the ground, solid. We couldn't believe it. Allied troops crossed the German border to occupy the Rhineland. At last, the goal of our ambitions is reached. The Rhine, der Deutsche Rhein, is now guarded by British troops. Instead of the Kaiser eating his Christmas dinner in London, we shall be having ours in the heart of Germany. In January 1919, delegates from Europe's exhausted nations arrived in Paris for the peace conference. We were journeying to Paris not merely to liquidate the war, but to found a new order in Europe. There was about us the halo of some divine mission. We must be alert, stern, righteous and ascetic. For we were bent on doing great, permanent and noble things. The British and French Prime Ministers, David Lloyd George and George Clemenceau, and America's President Wilson would decide Europe's future. For Lloyd George and Clemenceau, the priority was to break Germany's capacity to make war. They insisted that Germany must surrender all aircraft, all tanks and submarines, keep its army under 100,000 men, surrender all its colonies and pay financial compensation. It was also to give up territory in the east for the newly independent state of Poland. For some delegates who'd set out for Paris with high hopes, the terms were too harsh. If I were the Germans, I shouldn't sign for a moment. You see, it gives them no hope whatsoever, either now or in the future. But the winners had the power, as Lloyd George told the House of Commons. The terms are in many respects terrible terms to impose upon a country. Terrible were the deeds which it requites. On June the 28th, the peace treaty was signed in the Hall of Mirrors of the Palace of Versailles. Suddenly, from outside comes the crash of guns thundering a salute. It announces to Paris that the Second Treaty of Versailles has been signed. The conquering nations held their victory parades and life could begin to return to normal. But President Wilson had a greater ambition. A new world which war would never again ravage. A world where order would be kept by a new international peacekeeper the League of Nations. The League came into being on the 24th of April 1919. When he first proposed it, Wilson had said, It is a definite guarantee of peace. It is a definite guarantee by word against aggression. It is a definite guarantee against the things which have just come near bringing the whole structure of civilization into ruin. But as America retreated into isolationism, 
and Europe's nations began to tear themselves apart from within, Wilson's hopes would turn to dust. Four years of war had fueled new revolutionary ideas. Its outbreak was blamed on the old world order. Traditional political systems came under question. In London, there was a wave of industrial militancy, including strikes by soldiers who wanted to be demobilized. In the United States, an organization called the Industrial Workers of the World spread chaos on the streets. The wellspring of revolution was the Bolsheviks in Russia, but they were now under threat as the country degenerated into a bloody civil war. Without mercy, we kill our enemies in scores of hundreds. For the blood of Lenin, let there be floods of bourgeois blood. The Bolshevik Revolution had terrified people throughout Europe. Politicians were quick to exploit their fears. In Italy, Benito Mussolini promised what he called a third way, neither communist nor capitalist. His party was called the Fascisti. The new German Republic, consumed by the bitterness of defeat, was under siege from extremists of both left and right. In Germany, there is civil war. The public monies are wasted and put to selfish uses. The people, sunk to the lowest depths, wallow unrestricted in the freedom of the revolution. Massacres on the streets became commonplace. Already humiliated by its neighbors, it seemed now that Germany would destroy itself from within. The cry went out for a strong new leader. May Germany now find men to lead it who are as ready to accept responsibility as the commanders of the field. Men of strong purpose and firm will, capable of breathing fresh vigor into our feeble national life. Men who will unite all our creative forces in great constructive work. Ludendorff, the man who'd so nearly won the war for Germany, but ended up leading it to defeat, found his answer in the form of a young Austrian corporal, Adolf Hitler. World War I was supposed to be the war to end all wars. Instead, it was the first act in a European cataclysm that would flare up again in just two decades. They shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will have endured and we will have suffered, and so many men will have been slaughtered, and their names are now at the many gate. Tens of thousands who have no known graves. And I very often wonder whether the sacrifices that we made are worthwhile. That is, have the years condemned us? Because there is still war and still talk of war. Has it been all been worthwhile? I, yes, I think it would have been worthwhile because I think that the consciousness of the, well, Europe anyway, well, and most of the world, has been aroused to the futility of war. And that is what I hope will eventually be the result of the two world wars. The First World War was certainly tragic, but it wasn't futile. In the First World War, the Allies achieved a great negative victory. They prevented something from happening. They prevented the domination of Europe by militaristic, autocratic Germany. They prevented 
the suppression of democracy on the continent of Europe. The 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month has never and will never be forgotten. As distance fades the sharpness of memory, the final voices belong to the moment itself. This horrid, ghastly thing that we have lived with for four long years and more is past and done. There are to be no more brave lads butchered by the Huns or poisoned with their gas or to die of disease in the trenches. No more long casualty lists for dreading relations or friends to eagerly scan every morning. No more atrocities on land or sea. No more passenger ships to be torpedoed. No more air raids. All done with and gone now forever. It is at present unbelievable. It is too good to be true. I detach myself from the others and walk slowly up Whitehall with my heart sinking in a sudden cold dismay. All those with whom I had really been intimate were gone. Not one remained to share with me the heights and the depths of my memories. As the years went by and youth departed and remembrance grew dim, a deeper and ever deeper darkness would cover the young men who were once my contemporaries. The war was over, a new age was beginning, but the dead were dead and would never return.